so today I want to just carry on um, with the series. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, thanks, Shania. Um, Shania's been diligently recording and posting it up on YouTube. I encourage you, if you have not captured the heart of what God is doing and saying here uh, through our digital dilemma, through all the series, to, to really connect in. Go back to, um, to May 19, and that's the Sunday that Brad Huddleston preached, and, and just watch them in series. Because I really believe that the Lord is methodically, strategically, precisely just walking us through His idea, His thoughts, His plan, His way for how He desires us as His children to look and to live in the day in which we live in. Do you know that um, throughout history, there's been many revivals that have, that have stirred and, and, and come to life and, and right across the world where, where just people like you and me would, would just have this passion and this fervor and we, we'd, we'd begin to gather together and we'd just pray and there'd be this desire on us to see God move in a way that is different, move in a way that we expect Him to move. You know, that the, the Bible would just come alive and, and that we wouldn't just be living and uh, like we're following Jesus, trudging through life, but that there would be this life that we expect that God God has moving and living from us and within us. And throughout, throughout history, there would be pockets of people in all the land that would just come together and God would bring them together and they would begin to pray. And they would begin to set apart their time and their hour. There would be this urgency where they would be prepared to disturb their present, knowing that if they disturbed their present and they locked away some focused, specific time for the Lord, that God would listen, God would hear from heaven, and there would be a healing that would be poured out on the land. I don't know why I said all that. Where am I going, Lord? Hallelujah. There would be a cry of a great awakening. In, in Ephesians 5, verse, verse 13, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. You know, you know every era has had an evil. Every era, there's been something that's, that, that, that the society or the community or the culture has faced and has dealt with. Now, what's an evil, you might think? Well, it's, it's something that comes upon the people to oppress them. Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, it's a weight, it's a burden, it's, it's oppressive in its nature. And, and its whole idea, the evil of the age, is to oppress the people of the age. But praise God, Jesus said, I am the God of now, I'm the God of then, I'm the God of forever. And, the, and that the Father sent His Son so that the Son could establish in His people a new and living way that we could live separate in our evil age from the pressure and the oppression of the evil of the age. And so what revival does is a group of people that go, you know what, God? You know what, God? There has to be an awakening. And, and it starts from not me looking at you and going, you need to wake up. It starts from me looking at me and God going, you need to wake up. And where God speaks to my heart and he says, come on, son. Come on, son. And throughout history, there's been many multitudes of sons and daughters of men that have had a moment where they've been prepared to be disturbed in their present. And they would find calluses on their knees. They would find moments and times to pray and to say, God, let there be an awakening. Ephesians 5 says, uh, as I carry on, for the light makes everything visible. You see, we have an evil age, and it's across every age. But the light of the Lord Jesus Christ wants to light it up, wants to show it. And as we heard Matt and Chantel sharing earlier, the light of Jesus Christ has made visible the addiction in one's life. Can I say to you, you're a part of the average. Every one of us has an influence on the average. We heard Matt worked out. Matt's, Matt's studious. Matt's, Matt, Matt, Matt looked at it. He looked closely at his own life, and he said 152 days. And he worked out his time on screen, and he went, well, it's not 152 for me. It's, it's 80. So if Matt's 80 and the average is 152, who's sitting at 240? Every one of us is a part of the average. So you're not sitting here this morning going, well, this does not apply to me. This, this, this does not apply to me. This whole series about my digital dilemma is from my perspective to you. And if it's from my perspective to you and I'm a part of the average, then you're a part of the average. I don't know about you, but I want to be, you know, Matt's average of 80. He drags down 152. He pulls it. He pulls, he's, got a, he's got a downward pull. 
If 86% of the church is not praying, these are statistics out of Australia done through a national church survey. You're part of the average. Are you on the top end, pulling the 86 up? Come on, church, Life Impact Church. We as a church, we need to be pulling 86% of the church that doesn't pray, we need to be pulling that average down. So where does it start? It starts from the, the revival of a heart, the awakening in your heart where you respond. It's where you respond to God touching and tapping you on that shoulder, where you respond and you say, God, everything I've read about you, everything I know about you, I believe it's true, now I need to live it. I need to have an experience of you living this out. And can I tell you that over the last few weeks, since we've been focused on this particular area of, the, of our digital dilemma, there are ones of us who've been listening and feeling the tap on the shoulder and who has made some changes. Can I say to you, they're living a different kind of life. When you heard Matt and Chantel sharing this morning, you were listening to a different kind of life where Matt's vision exploded life into his wife's. And suddenly what God was doing in Matt was revealed he was doing in his wife. You know, there's this move, there's this thing, there's where God says, awaken. And when you respond to the awakening power of God, who knows who else might get up and go. Thank you, Matt and Chantel. Thank you. For feeling the tap on the shoulder and going, you know what? I'm a part of the average. I'm going to give my life to Christ so that my average... My life, my average life, pulls the average down. Let me read to you an insert in a book I'm reading connected to my digital dilemma. Did you know that, what, that Noah was a drunkard? He was a drunkard. We talked about Noah last night at young, young Adults. He was a drunkard. A drunkard was sent to a tree forest, and he had to decide what, pla- what trees were going to be suitable for an ark that was meant to float, that was meant to save mankind. God picked a drunkard. My goodness, God, surely there was someone better. You know, surely Noah was a drunkard. Jacob was a cheat. Moses was a murderer. Gideon was a coward. David was an adulterer. Jeremiah was a depressive. Matthew was a traitor. James and John were hotheads. Simon the Zealot was a terrorist. Peter was all talk. Paul was a persecutor of God's people. And then there was Samson. Every act of deliverance that Samson undertook started with his uncontrolled lust. Yet there he is, and there they are, among the heroes of the faith in Hebrews. God captures them in Hebrews 11.32. You see, none of us are qualified for service. If you think you're qualified for service... None of us are qualified for service. If we think we're qualified for service, we can never approach God. The only way we can approach God is when we recognize the only qualification we have is in Jesus Christ. The redemption of Christ by the power of the Spirit. The redemption of Christ by the power of the Spirit. Do you know, awake, let me get to this. Awake, O sleeper. Ephesians 5, verse 14. Our church camp awakened. Bless God. I found some prayer notes as I was going through my Bible. I got a new Bible case because my other Bible case packed it in. And uh, I, I was going through my Bible case and I found some prayers I'd been praying eight years ago. Hallelujah. Right there, smack bang in the middle was, oh God, we need an awakening. Oh my God, there has to be an awakening. Ephesians 5, awake, there's an awakening. Why is awakening important? If you don't wake up, you continue to sleep. That's a revelation. Someone needs to get that this morning. You're here this morning because you had a wake-up call. If you never had the wake-up call, bless God, there's an empty seat beside you that someone might have missed the wake-up call, and so they're still sleeping. God is saying, wake up. Wake up, church. And, and to this morning, I don't want to just yell at you, and I don't want to just shout at you. I want to yell at you and shout at you because, because God is saying, wake up, there's somewhere I want you to live from, and it's not from here. It's not where you currently are. He's not saying to the sleeper who needs to move where you are is good. He's saying to the sleeper who needs to move where you are is not how I planned it. 
You might be experiencing good. You might be having a meal here or there. But can I tell you, there's a new territory that God has a plan for new life to happen in your life from. Do you know what goes on? Like, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Do you know the, the, the chapter that it goes ahead of that, the verses, it, it speaks about imitating God in everything you do. Because you're his children. Live a life filled with, live a life filled with social media. Live a life filled with gaming. Live a life filled with it. If you live a life filled with it, you're imitating God. No, you are not. You know, we had a word this morning where God was speaking in our prayer meeting that uh, the, the, the young adults, the youth of our age, have been interfered with. They have been led astray by foreign influence. God has seen the foreign influence and he's saying, I'm not happy. And you know why he's saying I'm not happy? He's not looking for you to be perfect. He's saying I'm not happy because he knows the foreign influencer is keeping you under the pressure, under the oppression of the evil age. If you think there's not an evil age we're living in, hallelujah. Verse 3 says that, 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 that the awakening is this, so, so awake, some of us are sleeping in immorality. We're sleeping in sexual immorality, we're sleeping in impurity, we're sleeping in greed, we're sleeping in sins, we're sleeping in all kinds of foolish talk and coarse jokes. Come on, I've had a feed, come across Instagram. Once you're there and there you're laughing, all of a sudden it's like, hang on a second. Come on, wake up, wake up. We're sleeping in these things. Don't be fooled, in verse 6, by those who try to excuse their sins. Can I tell you, your digital dilemma has no more space for excuse. Come on, are you with me? Come on. You have a digital dilemma just like I do. And there's no more space for excuse. Remember what I said God said to me right back at the start in, in May 19. God said to me, why it was Brad was preaching, if you think you're the exception, you're proud. Come on. Every one of us is working on the average. Every one of us is influencing the average. And Ephesians 5 is saying, come on, don't be a part of the average of the evil age. Come out from among them and live separate. Don't be fooled in excuse of your sins, for the anger of God will fall on those who disobey him. Do you know, God called Israel to come out of the land of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, and they found themselves in this land that flowed with milk and honey. And this morning, I want to aim there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to, I'm going to move towards what the land looks like. I'm going to move toward where God is taking us so that God's not just speaking about what needs to stop, what is the oppression of the age we're living in, but when we decide to cross over, when we decide to trust God to part the Red Sea, when we decide we're going through and we recognize that there's a promise that God has for us that we currently aren't experiencing, when we, when, when we get it and we go, you know what, I'm going after the promise. I believe this morning God is wanting to get you to get a hold of the promise. And if we get a hold of the promise, we can look back at the past and we can go, I no longer desire that. I, I'm no longer like Lot. I'm no longer like Lot's wife that longs for what that was because there's been a shift in my understanding in my spirit. There's been an awakening. I have awoken from the sleep and slumber of what those behaviors and activities have stolen from me. Not just what they've hurt God in. Can I get you this morning? This is not just God having offense at our behaviors. It's God having a land that he wants us to live in that we're not in. You know, they're in this land and they have this great victory, Jericho, the walls of Jericho fall. And, and you know, they, they take some things they shouldn't take. They're told not to. They take them. And, uh, and they go to the next battle, and 36 of the Israelites die, and the smaller group of people have a victory over them. And then, and then Joshua goes, God, you just, you just brought us here to smite us. And God's like, hang on a second, stop it. You're in the land I promised you to be in, but you're not walking the way I told you to walk. Now, you're in the land. The land is a land that is the land, and it's the land. And I said it's the land, and the land are going to have promises. But don't, don't misunderstand who God is, Joshua. There's some people in the land who took what they shouldn't have. And, and those two 
those two families, the two guys that did it, you know, they, 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 took, they took a few things. And, and you know what they did? They took some silver and, um, and, and they buried the silver in their tents and they put it down low and then they put some dirt over the top. Then they buried the next thing they stole and put some dirt over the top. Then they buried the next thing they stole and put some dirt over the top. They had three layers. They had three backup plans. So if they were discovered, if it was found out that they took what they shouldn't have, oh God, you'll just find the first bit and I'll still have the second and the third. God knows the very depth of what you hide. God knows the very depth of what you're hiding in. God knows it. Do you know why we hide? Because we don't have a full understanding of the brilliance and the beauty and the magnificence of God. We recognize that there's been a separation. Adam and Eve, they hid from God after the separation happened because they recognized there was a brilliance and that they'd lost. You see, this whole series that God is going us through is that he's, he's going, hey, I want you to recognize there's a brilliance you can find. There's a life that I have for you to live where you can live in Mackay in your job. You can live in Mackay in your street. You can stay in the house you're in. You can be right there. But watch what's buried in the middle. Watch what's buried in the middle. Remember what the light does? It makes things visible. So what God is doing is he's making things visible right now in our life. So there's things going on before there's an awakening. In verse 10 it says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Thank you, Jesus, for this responsibility, this burden to stand before you and say, don't take any part, I'm going to expose them. But you know what's buried in your tent. God knows what's buried in your tent. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 4 as we try and segue across this this morning and get us to what the land that flows with milk and honey looks like. 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2. How do we, how do we segue? How do we shift? What's, what's, what, what is God needing to do? 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says this. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly. He's speaking clearly in last times. This is, if, if you're hearing uh, this morning that you have a problem with your mobile phone and how much time you spend on it, you don't need an interpretation. It's clear. Like I said a few weeks ago, you know, the, the moment the image came out of the smoker's lung, the smoker's lung, the smoker's lung right beside the healthy lung, the moment the images came out of the destruction that tobacco has on the human lung, the moment there was evidence Everything changed. No more excuses. And eventually, people begin to accept and move. But did you know that there was a preacher named Dowry back in the 1800s who spoke against the evil of the age? And one of the one things he spoke against was tobacco. He had this massive issue with tobacco. He, as he preached fiery about the Word of God and people came and repented and turned, they were throwing away their cigarettes. They were throwing away their cigarettes. There was an awakening. They came awake. They came alive knowing that in their life there was something that was destroying them. There was an awakening. Can I tell you, we're in the age that we're realizing and recognizing the digital technology influence that has just rushed through our life that has just been cast on us and thrown on us did you know that Elijah he hurled he hurled the mantle he hurled it at Elijah the world hurls stuff at us it's hurling it it wants us to be it wants to cloak up and close us with its way and am I speaking against technology well kind of figure it out ask the Holy Ghost what's your dilemma I'm currently in the middle of a fast a detox from technology and I'm still writing that invoice. Some of you have sent me texts. I've still been responding to the text messages. I recognize that communication is important. But I haven't watched and haven't done and haven't played and haven't spent time in any other measure. And it's been two weeks. And, and the reason why I'm doing it now is so that when we do it in August, I've already traveled the journey with you. I've already experienced what... The cost is to, to pull back and not be watching TV and not be, not be watching the football, hallelujah. And I'm not missing much, to tell you the truth. I miss the origin, bless God. 
Miss the Broncos? Praise God. And I've not missed anything. Bless God. Let's read this, verse 1 2. Um, he tells, turn away, right? He, there's, there's clear times that some will turn away. There's a turning away, and it's happened throughout history. Revival after revival, peaked and troughed, peaked and troughed, peaked and troughed. Did you know at the end of the first century, the Holy Ghost is manifesting in the early church, and things are happening according to God's plan and His intention. The, 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 the followers of Jesus are waiting on the Holy Ghost and they're waiting on the Holy Ghost and they're waiting on the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is moving and the Holy Ghost is doing things in meetings. The Holy Ghost is doing things in cities. And then suddenly about the turn of the first century, there was this shift on who they waited on. And suddenly in the end of the first century, the bishop started to be the one the church waited on. Do you hear what I said? And as soon as I started waiting on the bishop, as soon as they were expecting the bishop to do it, as soon as they were expecting the bishop to bring the, rev the revelation, the Holy Spirit and the dynamic of the power of God operating in their life dipped. And then there was a group of people again a few years later that, that went, come on, the Holy Ghost, come on, it's about the power of God. And those people hit their knees, they had an awakening, and holy, the activity of the Holy Ghost came up again. And then we got into man again, and then we went, come on. We're just like each other, which is why we need a community that recognizes the Holy Spirit when he speaks. Do you know when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, the, the, those disciples, 120 of them in the upper room, one thing you might not have considered they experienced that day was familiarity. I want you to think about it for a minute. The Holy Spirit came upon them. The room was filled. They started speaking in tongues. All kinds of crazy happened. They, they, all kinds of God happened. The city was changed. People's lives were changed. There was fellowship. There was prayer. There was all kinds of things. But did you know what the main ingredient was? Jesus said, I'm going and I'm sending. So when the Holy Spirit came, there was familiarity. They knew the Spirit of God. So God goes through seasons where he works us and he teaches us and he brings a familiarity to the word. He brings a familiarity to the behaviors. He, he, he removes behaviors and he ex exposes, he makes behaviors visible. I believe we're right at the cusp. We're right at the cusp where he's showing us we're going to recognize and it's going to be familiar that the Holy Spirit is going to move on us. And you need him to move in the middle of a digital dilemma. That's where you need him to move. Oh, you need him to move. I'm trying to get to away from true faith. And they followed a deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons, they come from foreign instructors, foreign sources. Can I say that when our children are following and going through social media, the influences on social media are a foreign influence. They're not the influence you want your children following. They aren't the influence you want your children following. They aren't the influence you want your children following. These people are hypocrites and liars. Their consciences are dead. Whose consciences have been seared your... your, your um, your Bible might say, seared with a hot iron, your conscience is dead. These are those who switch off their consciences so often that they can't switch them on again. That's what adulterers do. Adulterers push past their conscience while it screams at them to stop. Come on, that's what an adulteress does. They have a wife, they have a God, and the, their conscience screams at them to stop certain behaviors, and, and they don't stop. They just keep pushing past the stop button, and eventually their conscience is so sheared, it's so burned, it's so dead, there's no push, there's no, there's no interference that runs any longer. A told you push past their conscience while it screams at them to stop. What this digital dilemma is doing, sweeping through culture, is by design, by design, it aids you in switching off your conscience to God. It aids you. It's helping you. It's keeping you right on the edge of being dead. How many movies have you watched lately that young people just climb in and out of bed, no problem at all? 20 years ago, if you watched a movie, the percentages were lower. 
and, and, and we go and we be entertained as the church of Christ and we, we, we sit there and we, we take it in. We take it in. Guess what? Guess what the, the foreign influence is doing? It's influencing the young people of our age that you can just share yourself around and find and keep pressing and keep trying. God doesn't say that, does he? My digital dilemma, Psalm 32 is the, is the chapter that God gave us. I'm not going to go through it, but it's Psalm 32. It holds the key to my digital dilemma. With humility, grace overflows. With humility, grace, turn with me to James 4. James 4 verse 5, do you think the scriptures have no meaning? Do you think there's no purpose in what God says? Church, do you think there's no purpose in what God's saying? So, so when God speaks, we understand there's purpose in it, right? Verse 5, do you think there's no scripture, there's no meaning, that the scriptures are spoken in vain? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. Some versions talk about God yearns jealously. Did you know that Oprah Winfrey used to be a churchgoer? And her testimony is she heard that God was a jealous God one day and she said, no more God for me. I am not serving a God of jealousy. And so she goes into this massive career of, of, of media influence. And everything she says, everything she's for comes from the well of God. If he's jealous, I have got nothing to do with him. And she's just one woman that you've spent a lot of time listening to. No, let me rephrase that. She's just one woman that I know I've spent time listening to. See how, see how, see how, see how these things happen. And, and he gives grace more generously, more grace as the scripture said. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God. Come close to God. Come close to God. When you come close to God, God comes close to you. Religion says, get yourself right, get yourself sorted before you can come close. God says, no, you come now. You come now. You're hearing this morning. Some of you are here this morning. You're hearing come. You're hearing come to God, come to God, come to God. You're going, oh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not ready. I'm not right. I'm not. No, no, come. And he comes. Respond and he comes. Respond and he comes. This is what the word is saying. Do you think this is written in vain? Do you think there's no purpose in this? No, there's purpose in this. He says, if you come at the call to come, he will come. Like his desire to come to you is in the call to come. And he says, come, wash your hands. So come, wash. Not wash and come, but come and wash. I'll come and wash, come and wash. As he comes, if you come, he comes, you wash. Digital dilemma. You come, he comes, you wash. No, notice, notice, wash your hands. God doesn't have a big bath to chuck you in. He has redemption. He, you, 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 you become one with him, but you behave differently. You do some things differently. You wash, you wash your hands, you sinners. Come on, you sinners, you sinners. Sinners are called to come. So if you're struggling with your digital life and your screen life, come today. Come to the Lord. Lay it down. Awaken, awaken, awaken. You can come. You don't need to go through the detox first. You don't, I, I, I came first, and now God said, now I want you to deal with it. I want you to stop some things. Why is he wanting me to stop some things? Because I'm going to a land that flows with milk and honey. And on the other side of my stopping some things, there's some things he's starting. And they're alive in my heart already, and I'm not quite sure what they look like, but I'm going to try and get there and help you see some things this morning. Bless God. Purify your hearts, you. Your loyalty is divided. What's interesting here is that, that, that we cleanse, we wash, we wash from sin. So we're cleansed from sin. There's a cleansing. Jesus Christ cleanses us. We come to him, we get washed. We, we, we serve him, we follow. But then there's this, then there's this, this purity thing. And it's in, a, it's in another phrase. It's phrased differently. It says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. So the purity of the heart, I can be washed clean of my sin. I can wash my hands. I'm no longer a sinner. But I can still have impurity in my heart because I have two minds. I think that was the difference between Abraham and Lot. They were both known as righteous, yet Lot's impurity drew him to 
the impurity around him because he had two minds, he had two thinking. This whole, this whole dilemma you're in, it's time to go no more thinking about the world and only thinking about God and what God instructs me to do and he's going to lead me and speak to me and he's going to take me to the land that flows with milk and honey. Your hearts are divided between God and the world. Hallelujah. You see, that's what it is. That's the two minds. Do I have all of God or do I have some of the world? And some of the world says, some of the world always says, all of the world. Because you can't have God and the world. Let there be tears of what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Yes, God, bring me sorrow and deep grief. Come on, we're going to get this in context. Let there be sadness instead of laughter. Let there be gloom instead of joy. That's the God I'm going to humble myself before. Hallelujah. And it says here, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. What's this sadness? What's this, what's this all about? Well, well, with humility, grace overflows from abundant measures to measureless abundances. More and more grace, more and more grace to humble, to humble, to the humble. He dwells in us yearning jealously. So, so there's more grace there's more grace given, but there's resistance to the proud. You see, God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. The proud appear higher. That's what the proud is. So, so if I'm proud in heart, I just, I just hold myself a bit higher than what God says, than what you're doing, or what you're believing. Uh, I, 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 I just appear higher. Remember, it's an appearance. Because I'm not higher than God, and I'm not higher than you. Proud just makes me appear higher and God goes there's no appearances I'm not going to let you live in your appearances because your appearances are deceptive so he, he resists that he becomes your enemy he opposes you because he opposes you living in darkness because he has something better for you more grace you see, this word in vain means does it have no purpose. When he says he wants to dwell, he says, I am your house, you're my house, and it's a permanent house. It's where I reside. You see, God resides in us. Ephesians 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. One heart, one Christ, one Lord, not world and God. Only, only one. He dwells there. He resides there, being rooted and grounded in love. You see, for the Holy Spirit to dwell, he's saying divine power and influence dwell in the soul. When you, when you decide that you're not going to appear higher and you're going to humble yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you recognize your spot and your position, you, 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 you bring yourself down, you, you, you recognize you're lower, there's life to the soul. There's life to the soul. There's life to the soul. There's, there's a pervasion. God pervades your thinking. He just, he just works his way in and suddenly you're thinking different, Jazz. You know, he just works his way in and you can't explain it. But you've humbled yourself, and suddenly there's new kinds of thinking that bring life to a mortal soul. And, and, and then you start testifying of it. And you can't exactly define the origin of it or how it worked, but you know Jesus is involved. You know he's the one that did it. And, and, and that's the only way that it happens. So he invades you. He pervades your mind because he's dwelling in you. He has life in you. And I'm not spitting everywhere. Dwell in the soul to pervade, to prompt. He prompts and he governs. You see, this is why it's critical that we haven't switched off our consciences. Because if we switch off our conscience, we switch off the part of the soul where he prompts us and he speaks and he governs. And if we keep shutting it down, we're dead to his prompting. We're dead to his governing. See, the Holy Spirit dwells where righteousness prevails and is practiced. That's why he's jealous. He's a jealous God because he invades you. As you follow Jesus, you give your life to Jesus, and you recognize who he is, and you recognize that you can't save yourself, and, and he comes and dwells in you at your confession and belief of faith, he yearns jealously to be the one who influences your moves. That's why he's jealous. So Oprah had a problem with God influencing her moves. She said, I'll believe in God, but he's no way is he going to influence my moves. So he rejects, she rejected the jealous God who says, no, you're mine, and I yearn jealously for you. I yearn to influence your faithfulness. I yearn to influence your moves, your lives, your practices. I am here speaking to us about our practice of righteousness. He loads us up with grace for this purpose. More and more grace, measureless yearnings of grace. He yearns. He means to dote. Did you know he lusts after you? 
You say, oh, that can't be a right interpretation of the word. Well, it is. He dotes, he lusts. It's an intense desire which breeds an earnest jealousy for the practices of your life to be modeled and imitated by, of God. Remember what we need to awaken to. We awaken to imitating God, not imitating the world. As you get nudged on your social media page, as you get nudged across by some algorithm, as you get nudged, the world is trying to influence you to purchase and to spend at your pleasure what they want you to spend it at, where you're investing your time and your money. He intensely craves possession. This is the God we serve. You can't have two minds. Oprah chose one mind. She was no longer two-minded. She said, no, once I learned this about God, I choose independence of God. Because I will not be filled with the Spirit of God who craves my possession for me to follow after Christ. Are we that church? Church. He desires with intensity. You see, he's taken up his abode within us. He longs enviously. He feels envy and he shows envy. Can I say to you that God is not just feeling disappointment. He is not just feeling jealousy. He shows it. When they went into the land, the Israelites went into the land, and those two families had their levels of buriedness in the middle of their tents, God showed his envy. He didn't just say, I'm jealous of you. You went and served another God. You adulterers. He said, I'm going to show you how I feel. And the earth opened up and they were swallowed up. You see, I want to be everywhere where God is. I don't want to be anywhere where God isn't. That's the fear of God. I want to be everywhere where God is, not where he isn't. He, he shows it. Do you know he shows his envy? He shows it with more grace. He shows it with more grace. He shows it with more grace. He's not just opening up the earth and swallowing us all up. He sent Jesus so that he could show more grace. More grace. We need more grace. We need more grace. Remember, we need to be able to come so that we can wash our hands. Not wash our hands over here because, because there's no washing there. There's only the appearance of it. There's only the appearance of it, but you're not clean. The land flowing, milk and honey, I'm going there, I've got to get there. It's 11 o'clock, hallelujah. What is it doing at 11 o'clock? I have a dilemma. You've answered my dilemma. But we'll have to change some things. I'm going to keep going, but we're going to change some things. We're, going to do, we're not going to do everything we plan to do. He gives us, he lets us have, he grants us, he delivers it up, he brings forth his grace. There's more of it, there's big, exceeding and mighty amounts of it. There's, there's, there's this graciousness, there's this, there's this power to gratify you. Do you know what our digital dilemma has done to us? It's killed our pleasure center. It's killed our pleasure center. Right smack bang, Taya talked about our brains have been designed. There are now images, scientific images, of a child's brain or a person's brain or an adult's brain who spends their life looking at a screen. And you can see their brain has more dead spots in it than a cocaine user. The, the, the excuse is done. The images are out. So, so right across the world, there's this dilemma of the, young, of, of the generation 40 years and younger that have their ple pleasure center invaded by the culture, invaded by the evils of the world, invaded, and they've had their money taken from them. Come on, the, the companies that are selling this stuff, they're not, they don't care that your brain's dead. The guys that, that Dowie preached against with the tobacco sales for hundreds of years, the tobacco guys, they don't care that you're smoking yourself to death. They don't, they don't care. They just want your money. And they're going to just up it. And, and, and the government's answer to stopping the problem is we'll take more tax from it. We'll try and make it cost you more. But if you have an addiction, you pay more. You pay more. But, but Jesus is the answer to break the addiction. He's the one that says, I have more grace to those who will step down and no longer appear like you've got it together. Right? I've got more grace. So what does, what does the land flying with milk and honey look like? What's available to us? What does our new life look like? Where is he leading us? Uh, is he leading us to a place where I've just got to sit down in the corner and i just got to go, well, now I've got four hours spare. Man, my fingers are looking. Like, like what are we going to do? Do you think that God wants you to spend another four hours in the Bible? Do you think that God wants you to spend another four hours praying? 
Do you think that God wants, God wants, God wants? Well, well, yes, he does. But can I say to you, don't panic. Stop panicking. Moses was a panicker, and because he panicked, he protested. You see, the, when, when you panic, you protest. You do, when you panic, you protest. We've had, we've been in panic for the last four years with COVID. We panic and we protest. No, don't make me have that. Don't make me stop this. Don't make me do that. And so we protest. And most of us probably hit the streets with a placard and we've never done that ever before. I have so many invitations to be an activist during COVID. So many, so many invitations. Would you come and join this march? Would you come and join that march? We're protesting. What are we protesting against? We're protesting because we don't know what we're doing. I, I, we don't know what the answer is. Well, the government doesn't know, we don't know, so let's just protest. God, that's, it. That, that's not his answer. So where's he leading us? Panic, calm down, don't panic. Don't panic. I am he, has our afflictions, our troubles and our trials. He knows what's happening in our homes and our cities. He knows what's buried in the middle of your tent. He isn't just making judgments against us. He's not just making judgments. I want someone, someone has to get this this morning. This whole series is not God the judge going, eh, bum, bum. George, three levels, Brett. Come on, I'm getting right to the silver that you buried down there in case the gold vases were found and the other things were found. That's not God, what God's doing. He's not just going to judge you. He's going, I am he that finished the work of bringing you out of captivity. And I want you to experience it. Remember, he's a God that doesn't just feel jealousy. He shows it. So, so he's a God that doesn't just feel your affliction. He shows that you're feeling your affliction by bringing you freedom. That's the God we serve. And I don't know about you, but I think there's, there's a city that needs to hear that this is the God we serve. He's not the one that just says, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's the one that, he's the God that says, if you have a wife and she's dear to you, you know, Eli and Lydia are going to get married on Friday and the God that they serve says, no other man can touch that woman of yours, Eli. I'm the God that is going to protect that beautiful bride of yours. I'm the God that's going to govern the region and no man can touch her. And so Eli goes, that's my God. Yeah, baby. Yeah, that's my God. I'm going to serve that God. And Lydia's going, that's my God. Yeah. And that they'd come out of a land where any Egyptian could just go, that woman, I'll have her. And the husband just had to sit by and watch. Tell me what kind of God that is. So as God is declaring and he's making judgments, it's not just to make the judgment. It's to govern your life with life and prosperity. That's what he wants. He wants to be the governor. And there can only be one governor. Otherwise, there's impurities. So I am he who has finished what he has been required to do. Jesus finished it. And he desires us. He has a store. He has a store where something can come from and come to you. Your digital world has no store. All it does is take from your store. Hour after hour after hour of you seeking pleasure, it offers you nothing. You have no pleasure. You know, you have no pleasure. You're just watching the football, and it's just innocent. You're watching the football, but now you're a gambler. Now, now it's just it's nudged you into the fact that you've got some financial issues, and so you, know, you can bet that the first try is going to be scored by Coates. And Coates is there, and he's running down the wing, and he tears his hammy. Coates just tears his hammy. I don't know what he does. He just tears him. And there goes my future with Coates' hammy. God is going, that's not, I'm not that God. I'm not that God. I'm another, you don't have to rely on someone's hammy, George. Bless God. You don't have to rely on my voice. No, I won't. There's storehouses. God has storehouses. And you know what the storehouses, the name of the storehouse is promises of God. Promises of God. Promises of God coming from, coming from and entering to. Coming from and coming to. Storehouses of promise. It's okay, we're going to finish around the same time. Don't panic. Who wants to protest? 
Oh, hallelujah. Shania put a hand up to just adjust the camera, and I thought, Shania, are you protesting? <coughs> <laughs> hallelujah. I need some oil in my throat. I'm, I'm going to get you here. It's the 7th of the 7th, 1924, and I've got calm written on my page again. <coughs> I've been ignoring calm down all morning. God's intention for Lot, as Taya preached, was all his family going to promise. That was his intention. Come out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The evil is going to be judged. Come on out, you people. And the sons went, I'm not going nowhere. Are you crazy? God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't do that. Well, how do you know? Where's your certainty? When the Bible is full of God saying, I yearn jealously. I dwell in you and out of you because I dwell in you. I yearn that faithfulness would be the story of your life. And I don't know about you, when I did an audit and I was spending 152 days because I'm an average man, right? And I was spending 152 days a year bound and caught on my screen. That's half my life. And, and I have the audacity to say to my wife, we can't afford it. The provider of the home, the one who takes responsibility for my wife's dreams and my wife's plans and her security and her safety, and I'm sitting there spending 152 days behind a screen, I'm not earning anything when I'm spending 152 days behind a screen. So does God want me to spend another 152 days in the Bible? No, he wants me to spend some of that time being a responsible leader of my home. Come on. Come from. There's promises. There's promises. There's promises. Exceeding abundant power to qualify everyone for the promise. You have a promise from sin, affliction, addiction, pride, protest, and defiance to promise. From sin, addiction, affliction, pride, protest, and defiance to promise. And there's more grace than you can throw your grace stick at. Well, God, I don't know. Well, God, I need. Well, God, I'm just not sure. Well, just get on your knees and watch God blow your minds. Come on, if you want to experience God, get on your knees. That's where you'll find him. It's not appearing higher. Well, I have this under control and I can do what I like. Well, you'll just be 152 days a year doing nothing. And maybe you are the higher part of the average. Maybe it's actually 196 for you. And maybe it appears... Maybe it appears, maybe you think it's only 80, but if you actually did an audit, do you know that most of us think we earn more than we actually earn? You know why we think that? Because we spend more than we actually should. It's true, right? Because we think something different. There's an appearing, we, we, there's, there's this appearing. Grace speaks with authority. It speaks with authority. Do you not know that the word is not written with vain? That there's no purpose in that statement when God says, I'm going to give you more grace. I'm going to grant it to you. I'm going to pour it out to you. That's the God that we serve. He's going to give us more grace. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves before the one who gives more grace. But what for? Why would I do that? Well, the promised land has rest in it. To the weary, it flows with rest. In our digital dilemma, rest is promised, but it's not in any of the storehouses that you're currently seeking it in. The promised land has your rest. It has your pleasure. It has your delights all wrapped up in it. But our addictions are telling us, keep coming back, keep coming back. You know it's empty. You know there's no life there. You need a move of the Holy Ghost. You need an awakening. You need the Holy Ghost to touch you. When you drop your knee and say, oh my God, more grace, grace will come. Because he said, if you come, he comes. Come on, his word is true. It's coming into your life. You see, our behavior doesn't qualify us for the promises of God. Jesus' righteousness does. Jesus' righteousness qualifies us. Grace provides access to Jesus and his righteousness, qualifying us for the promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. A land flowing with milk and honey. He wants our submission. God's grace calls us to the promise. Our digital addiction and protest, our idolatry, our adultery doesn't disqualify us from serving God. It doesn't. You were never qualified to begin with. You were never qualified to begin with. Your qualification is in Christ. So if you're sitting here this morning going, oh, I know what's buried three levels down in my house, and bless God, I gotta go and dig in today before I, I gotta get it up and I gotta sell it, or I gotta get it out, I gotta give it away to someone else, I gotta find it. No, come to God. Come to God. 
Because if you start digging and you start hiding, the earth will open up and you'll get swallowed up by it. That's what happened throughout history. You know, history is one of the greatest examples of what's going to happen in the future. If I'm looking for you and you're at the, <clears throat> you're at the football every Friday night and, and I've, 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 I've lost touch with you, but for the five years that I knew you, well, let's say me, right? You're looking for me and the five years you knew me, I was at the football every Friday night. I was watching it or I was at it. So there was a pub I was at or there was a place I was at or there was a field I was at. If, if in two years' time you're looking for me, guess where you're going to start? You're going to start looking for me where you knew I was. Right? So history, history, history has some of the answer. And so God is speaking about things that have gone past. Let's take note. If you think you qualify by going and digging up your riches and trying to sell them and give them away, no, it comes after Jesus is in your house. Zacchaeus climbed a tree and said, look at me, find me, Jesus. Oh, I've, got a, I've got a whole bunch of stuff I've done wrong. And then Jesus comes into his house and he gives it back. God calls. He calls, come to the promise. All you broken, afflicted, addicted, idolatrous, idolatrous, adulterers. You're addicted, idolatrous, and idolatrous. I don't, I don't. We are, we struggle. Matt said it before, we need a community that accepts it. You know, as a church, if we, if we can accept, we're not qualified. We haven't got it all polished and all washed up. But God, we're coming. We're coming, and as you speak, there's going to be a washing. As you speak, there's going to be singleness of mind. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, capture, we're going to capture what you're saying, God, in our minds. We're, we're going to sing, there's going to be a single track, a single train. There's going to be purity. There's going to be sanctification. Can I just show you something about Eden? God planted the, a garden, and he said it was the Garden of Eden. And, and he had this plan in the Garden of Eden that he would put man in and man would prosper in. The garden, the garden, the garden was an enclosure. It was a territory. It didn't just flow into another territory and then to another territory and then another territory on earth. It was a fenced enclosure. And God's desire was to put him inside an enclosure. Put him inside safety and security. And he called it Eden. It was the place of pleasure and delight. It doesn't mean pleasure and delight. Eden is pleasure and delight. So he, he, God's idea was that, that your pleasure center, smack bang here in the middle of your noggin, and all the chemicals that happen and, and, and the reactions and the responses, that, that what our digital dilemma has done, it's killed our brain so that we come to God and we're bored. We come to God and we sit in church and we're looking at the time and it's 11.12 and we're bored. And I've shouted myself hoarse, I've entertained, I've jumped around, I've, I've animated. You know, there's something for you to look at, there's something for you to hear. I've, 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 I've given it my best shot to just not have you go to sleep on me. But, you know, but, but some of us have just spent so much time in this world, the evil of the age, that it's got the colors, and it's got the coding, and it's got the algorithms, and it's working you, it's working you, it's working you, it's killing your pleasure center so that you can't experience the Garden of Eden. And so as God was speaking to his children as they came out of Egypt, he was going, this is not a place of pleasure and delight. I'm going to take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. I'm, I'm taking you to a land. He's, he's reintroducing this concept of the garden. He's reintroducing it in Christ. The Father's going, I reintroduce to you, George, when you follow me, when you give up your life, when you humble yourself to my lordship, I reintroduce to you a land and enclosure where you can live and all your pleasures and delights can be satisfied in it. And, and you can have trial, you can have trouble, you can have breakdown, you can have brokenness, you can have all the things that are happening inside that territory, but you have pleasure and delight in God there. And while we're bound in our addictions, the pleasure centers of our minds are being dumbed down. We're like we're in a drunken stupor, and there's no worship, there's no service, and there's no witness. And then we, the church, begin to pick on the church, and we say, where's the worship, where's the service, and where's the witness? Well, where are the, of the average, pull on the average down. Or taking the average up. So what's the land that flows with milk and honey look like? It's a place where you can now say, you see, what Israel had to do was I'm going to decide, I'm going to choose to mourn over my, over my past. James 4, we were talking about laughter to tears and mourning. There's a choice this morning that the laughter we find in our digital dilemma, the joy we find in this space, I can mourn. That can be dead to me. And now where my joy was, I'm going to find mourning. That, that I'm making the exchange. And, and the land that God promised is that flows with milk and honey is going to bring you full delight. A place.
place of delight, the land that flows. Where God is taking us is to the pleasure center, back to the pleasure center, healing the destructions of our brains to bring a generation to restoration. I'm not going to ask the worship team to come up today. I'm just going to finish with prayer. And I'm going to leave it to the Holy Ghost to deal with us this morning and just cap off and round out because I understand you have things you need to eat and things you need to do. But God has exposed our digital addictions. He's exposed our, our issue with technology. And, and what he wants to do is he wants to highlight and he wants to declare to us that the land that flows with milk and honey, what, is it, what does it look like in that land? Can you imagine... Can you imagine a particular land enclosed with the boundaries where as a people you live and God will be your God and you'll st he will stand out like he's never stood out before? You see, when, when God had a plan for Israel to move from Egypt into the land of Canaan, his plan was that his people would stand out, that they would live this life where God would be their God and, and there, there wouldn't just be the Ten Commandments that were being observed and all the laws. There would be the God himself, the mercy, the grace, the magnificence of God standing out above every other people group. And if I asked you honestly this morning and you said, my relationship with Jesus Christ, is it standing out? Is, there, is, is when I face a trial and a, and, and, a, and, a, and a struggle, is there a light? Is there, is, there, is there a joy in me? Is there a capacity? Do I have something I can hold on to that the world doesn't? Or do I, do I only have going to tobacco and going to, to, to movies and going to all the places that offer and present to you? They have a store that meets your needs, but their stores are empty. God has a promise and a store that says, I am the God that's going to stand out. Your God, mighty God, majestic and all-powerful. When he said a land, that's what he was saying. He said, I'm taking you to a land where you're going to live and I'm going to live standing out above you. If God lives in a way that stands out above you, everything he stands for is yours and you experience it. That's what's going to bring revival. That's what's going to change the land. When our friends and family see that God we serve stands out above every other thing, when it's flowing, there'll be a gushing forth of life. Who needs a gushing forth of God's kind of life? I need a gushing forth of God's kind of life in my throat right now. <laughs> Always of what's promised. The promises God has in store will come from promise and flow. What we have faithfully trusted as a promise will flow freely and active in that land. So as we prepare to deal with our digital dilemma and we come into August and we look like, okay, God, I need to cut off. There needs to be a shift. There needs to be a change. I'm going to humble myself, I'm going to drop to my knee and, and, and I'm going to deal with some of these behaviours and activities. For two weeks I've been able to use my phone as a phone and a, and a communicator. And, and you know, six weeks ago I, I thought that it wouldn't be possible just to use my telephone as a telephone, as a means of communicating. But you know it's possible. And as you know, I've devoured 670 pages of books and, and it took, it, that's a five-year history for me before six weeks ago. I've read three books in, in six weeks. And, and that's just one thing of the exchange. And, 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 and there's this life in there and there's this flow in there and God's teaching me and he's showing me. Can I say to you that the milk is a pro productivity explosion? So when God says a land flowing with milk, he wasn't saying it's going to be a wash with white stuff that comes from cows and you're thinking, well, I'm allergic, I, I can't drink it. What am I going to do in a land that just has udders flowing milk everywhere? No, he's saying there's going to be an explosion of productivity. Who wants an explosion of productivity? Who has a dream that they believe is from God? Come on, who has a dream? Matt and Chantel shared a dream, a, a, a long dormant dream about having camps. Imagine now they're in a land that flows with productivity explosions. And, and they, they offered some things. They suggested some things. They said numbers of things. They said these kinds of things. Well, they're in a land now where that's possible. Honey, baby. Can I tell you what honey is? <laughs> um... <clears throat> 
It's abundance upon abundance upon abundance of pleasure and delight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have promised us that there's somewhere we're going. And for some of us in the room this morning, Lord God, we've, we've come this morning at, at a tap on the shoulder or a, an unction in our heart. And, and it's been hard to get here. But Lord God, we've come. And, and so you've, you've, you're already here. You're already where we've come to. Happens to be 5 Wellington Street this morning. This location, this building, there's nothing special about, special about the building, but, but Lord, it's where our, caming, our, where our coming stopped, where it's where we've paused, we've come to. We've come to. We've come to expect something from you, God. Maybe we've fulfilled a promise or a word or, or, or we're trying to overcome something. But God, I thank you this morning that you're speaking, that you've heard our cry and maybe we've, we're going, well, I haven't cried out anything. But in your heart, you said, I really want this to work. In your heart, you've said, oh, it really hurts me that that didn't work. In your heart, you've said, I just, I just need a shift or a change. I, in your heart, you've said, oh, this thing that just keeps buffeting me, that just keeps marring my life, I just, if it wasn't there, or, or, or maybe, you know, that's a cry. And, and, and maybe it's, let's talk about our, our screen time. Maybe it's you're on the phone and you're flicking, or your kids are on the phone and they're flicking, or your kids are on the whatever it is, or you're on that game and, and, and it's like I'm only going to play it for an hour and, and, you know, eight hours later. And, and you know, you're only going to, only going to, only going to, and you get off and you do something and, and there's regret. There's disappointment. There's failure. There's, there's oh, my God, there's nothing here. Why, why am I, why is this? I really, that's a cry. And we thank you this morning, Lord, that you hear the cry of the oppressed. And so, Lord, this morning, we just, we just right here in this moment, we have a choice, every one of us, in this moment, gathered together, having heard you speak and me spit and me squeal, God, you've, you, we haven't been listening to Brett this morning. We've been waiting for the Holy Spirit. And maybe we haven't phrased it like that, but that's the truth of it. And Holy Spirit, you're just leaning on us. You're, you're whispering, you're saying, come. Just come right now. Well, what does that look like? Do I have to go somewhere? You, you, what, he's, what he's saying is right now you can come, you can choose, you can go. God, I'm no longer going to put myself in the place where I appear higher. I choose to not be proud, and I just, I just say in my heart right now, get ready to say something in your heart, and it's, it's your choice because no one's going to hear you. But God looks at the heart. You've been living in a space where you've been trying to live to please people because you know that people look at what they see and they, they make a judgment and they accept you or they don't, they reject you or they don't based on what you do. Well, God is not wanting you to do anything that's outwardly expressive or exposing right now. He's wanting you to do something that's inward. It's you and God, and he's, he's right there, and he's, he's saying, come to me in your heart. Believe. Believe in me. Believe, believe that without me, Jesus is saying that without me, you can't, you, you, you can't make it. You can't make it work. You can't make it happen. You'll have some wins, but you'll be watching something. You'll be expecting something, and somebody's hemi will just break. They'll just throw their hamstring, and you'll be left in despair again. You see, God is saying to you, I don't fail. I have a storehouse of promises, and the only way the only way the storehouse of promises, everything I promise you are experienced is if you come to me. Because if you come to me, I come to you. And I bring to you what's in my store. Sure, you can look at life and you can have successes and you can, you can, you can live your life, but one day there's going to be no tomorrow. And when that one day comes, when there's no tomorrow and you've appeared like you've got it together and that you're 
almost like the governor of your future, you will find that there was indeed a governor of your future and his name was Jesus. And he's the one that's speaking to you right now. So in your heart, you can simply say, I bow my heart to you, Jesus. I come to the altar. I come to the place where you deserve glory and reverence. And I just, I just bend my heart. I bow it. I fold it this morning. Where, where I've refused to fold my heart, God, where I've f- refused to bend it, this morning I accept that if I stay in a straight space in my heart, I can't ever be pure before you because I've chosen myself over you. And one thing I've heard this morning is that there is one who's greater than me. And I've seen a, a guy dancing around, speaking about it and preaching about it. And I was expecting some other things. I was expecting some music today or some other things, but all I got was that. But, but that's all you needed this morning to sit here and go, God, I bow my heart. Now, Lord, with hearts bowed, as we lift our, as we lift our eyes with our hearts bowed, we, we say to you, God, we've done that, but I'm going to go home and what's going to change? Well, promise is what's changed. The hope of promise is what's changed. And now, like Noah, you can just grab your axe and you can just go one tree at a time. God gave Noah over a hundred years because he knew that it would just be one tree at a time, that it'd be with an axe, that he'd have to sharpen it with a stone, and that maybe his sons wouldn't be as productive today as they were yesterday. And, and oh my God, how are we going to do it? But God, we accept that you are God and that we are not and that we need you. And now God, with hearts bent and hearts bowed, we say, Father, forgive us. We repent, we, we make a decision that we're not going to live like we have lived. And for some of us, it's a first-time decision. For some of us, it's a, it's a recognition that restoration is required and that there's rescue that's needed, that there's deliverance that's needed, there's everything that's needed to face and to access the land of overwhelming plenty, of all the things that you're going to stand out in our life in. And so, God, we repent for crucifying you. We repent for burying you. We repent for ignoring you. We repent for not listening to you. We repent as our, as our Lord and God. We repent for not following you as Lord. And now today we pray, we shift from the altar. We shift from the altar where we know now we have justification. We've been forgiven because we've repented and confessed our sin. Now, God, we shift. We shift to the upper room. We shift to the upper room and we say to you, Lord God, we're going to wait for you. We're not going to wait for a preacher. We're not going to wait for the next movie. We're not going to wait for the next game. We're not going to wait for the next flick of a scroll. We're not going to wait for the next drink. We're not going to wait for the next woman. We're not going to wait for the next man. We're not going to wait. We're not going to wait for anything other than you, Holy Ghost. We are transitioning. We recognize you're alive. We recognize you have defeated sin and death, that you have resurrection power. We've heard about it today. You're alive, God. And so now we're in the upper room and we're saying, God, this is where we live from here on in. And you're going to throw us out into the streets. You're going to throw us out into our life and we're going to live a different life under the power of your spirit. Now, Lord God, I ask that from the upper room, we've heard your instruction, but we know that hearing your instruction and wanting to follow it isn't enough, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray right now, you would overwhelm, you would flood over and over and over Lord, let there be an avalanche. Let there be a flood, Lord God. Let there be a a surge, Father God, of you shedding your love abroad in our heart. Let our hearts right now, Lord God, know. Let our hearts know and become familiar with love. You, the God of love. 
Lord God, I thank you. And so as, you, as there's a familiarity, as you're flooding us and flowing into us and through us with your love right now, Lord God, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and flood our hearts. Flood our hearts, Lord God, that, that you aren't just impressed by what we're doing now, Lord God. You're moving by what we're doing. You said we've come to you. You said come to me and I'll come to you. So, Lord God, I thank you that there's a washing. There's a purification, Lord God. There's humility. There's the much that we need, Lord God, from the power of the Spirit to live out the life in the land that you've promised we shall experience that life in. Lord God, you're now going to be our pleasure center. We're going to experience new levels of pleasure from new sources. The source of worship, the source of prayer, Lord God, the source of productivity, the source of servant of service one to another. Lord God, I think that there's going to be new levels of pleasure that come from submitting to one another. Lord God, as you, as you map it out in your word, as you map it out in your epistles, as you map it out in your scriptures, Lord God, I thank you that every promise, every storehouse, Lord God, that has a promise of pleasure and delight held up in it, that has the promise of productivity explosions, that has the promise of abundance, Lord God, I thank you. Let promise, let promise arrive. Jesus, you said that I'm going to send the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost, that in you, Holy Spirit, is carried every promise that Jesus' victory on the cross finished and won for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would inspire us as we head and think about August, Lord God. Lord, as we think about a month that we're that we're saying is a revival month. Lord God, if we follow Jesus, if we're serious, Lord, if we're serious about having you as Lord, then a revival makes, then a revival, a revival brings us pleasure. The thought of a revival in our heart, the idea of a revival, the, the, the thought of being rescued and revived, God, the very, the very mention of the word revival, Lord God, I think that there's a whole new dimension around the word revival. There's a whole new appetite. There's a whole new hunger. There's a whole new shift right now, Lord God, that by your Spirit is coming upon us, Lord God. Where Peter said before he had the Holy Ghost, I'm going to stand up for you, but when the pressure was on, he fell away. Lord God, when he had the Holy Ghost on him, Lord God, he just stood up and he stood up and he stood up and he stood up to the point where one day he looked around and his shadow landed on someone and they got healed and he went, oh my God. Oh my, the promise has come. The promise has come. God, I thank you that September, oh, Lord, let September spring forth. Lord God, as you take us through the pain of, of August, Lord God, we're not going to deny it, Lord God, that, that our laughter is going to turn to mourning. You've, you've warned us, you've showed us in Scripture that when we humble ourselves, there's going to be some tears. My God, I thank you. My God, I thank you that our tears are going to be the flow of the waters of river of life that comes from the land flowing with milk and honey. It's not coming from the land of our oppression. Well, God, it's not, we're not going to long for what was. Our tears, Father God, are going to come from our longing for what is. You're going to sustain us and strengthen us. You're going to equip us and guide us. You're going to inspire us, God. Every one of us in the room is going to look different. And so, God, I thank you as we respond to what our life looks like in difference to each other, Lord God, we recognize that there's only one God that can live in the heart or impurity resides there. And that God has to be you. And so, God, we thank you that you have said to us in this season, I am your God. I am has spoken. And when I am speaks, it is always about coming from affliction into the land of productivity. And so we thank you for that land we're going to live in. And your mantle that you're going to stand out in our lives, Lord God, is going to cause many to watch and see that their gods have eyes and ears and mouths and tongues and heads and arms and legs, but they have no life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah, what do you got, Chantel? Absolutely.
gosh, my heart was nearly jumping out of my chest. <laughs> so I just, I just have to be bold and I just have to share some things with you guys. Um, I've been studying the book of Acts with a few ladies in the church and um, recently we were going through the book, um, chapter 5, and where it talks about Ananias and his wife where they sold their possessions but they came before the prophets and they only, s they only told them about a portion of what they sold and thought that they would get away with not sharing the bit that they were hiding but God knew and in that moment they gave their last breath and there was no more Ananias and no more his wife. And I just, it's like God brought that to me twice this morning. So I feel that there's significance in that just with what Brett has shared, you know, with the three layers. It's like we now have an um, opportunity, church, to bring all to, to, the, to the feet of Jesus, to bring all to God in this season that we're in and the, and the month of August that we're heading in. Don't hide anything. Don't tell God that this is what I'm bringing you when you have something at home that you're hiding. Bring it all to the feet of Jesus. I was talking to Tay and we were trying to wrestle out some of what chapter five meant. And there was a significant part that we came to where... Um, Yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. You know, the, 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 what was going on at the time was like a revival, you know, and, but the people were like, oh, like they were too scared to join. And we were like, what does that mean? And there was a commentary that I had read and, and um, that something that really stood out to me is like, <laughs> we need to be serious about serving our God. <laughs> if we cannot show the world the seriousness of following Jesus, then how could they ever come to the feet of Jesus? How could they ever um, desire, you know, or hunger for something, you know, if we can't show them? So church, I really believe and I really feel in my heart that it's time to get serious. It's time to show the world the seriousness of following Jesus. <clears throat> Yoni, what do you want to share? Oh. Come here, Yoni. Just before Yoni shares something, you know, I've just been, one of the cool books I've read, don't sit down. Oh, yeah, good. I thought you were running away. One of the books I've started reading is a, is a historical book on revivals from the upper room till I've got to about the 18, 1800s. And one of the significant factors around when the Spirit of God's poured out is that the people of God would come to meet. Yeah. And one preacher would preach and then another preacher would preach. Another preacher would preach. Well, here's another preacher that's going to preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I was just like, he's in the music team isn't coming up. And I was like, but I had something to say. <laughs> um, Nadwa, can you bring my phone, please? We're going to be a little bit longer, sorry. Look, I, I was just contemplating yesterday. Um, wasn't even tired. I'm still on a, I'm on a roll from conference. Like, it was so good. There were so many things. I was talking to my brother, Namaka, and I was, he was like, how's conference? I was like, how long you got? Yeah. And so, Look, um, and, and I was just thinking about, you know, the, the, the changes that we go through. Like, my goodness. You know our God? He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And he's the same tomorrow. He never changes. I was, I've just done 3,000 kilometres in the last seven days by myself, driving by myself. And I was like, what the? How did I do that? You know, out of that, you can get tired. You can, you know, there's, there's traffic on the road. There's rain. There's semis coming up behind you. There's so many things. So many things that change. Nothing is constant. But our God is constant. Amen. Yeah. Our God is so yeah. constant. I've just got to find my notes because I'm starting to shake now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I was just, um, in my own personal life, it's, it's coming up to a year where a lot of things have changed for me. I've had to change 
my testimony. My testimony is different and it's so exciting because God's showing me new things. You know, I've come out of the darkness into his glorious light. And, 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 it's, and it's something that changes every day. You know, we might be thinking that we're walking in the light, but God's got more. Yeah. He's got so much more for us, hey? Um, I went to this um, concert last night, festival. Christine Arnu was there. And it was called Between the Tides. And I was thinking, I wonder why they call that Between the Tides, you know? And I thought about, you know, the sun and the earth and the gravitational force of the tides and the fish and everything that happens, everything that's affected from those things. You know, we go through motions of change, different motions of change like yesterday's not going to be the same as today. We're going into another minute, we're going into another second, things are going to change. We go through the motions of change, but I just wanted to encourage you, church, that Jesus never changes. Jesus is always the same, and he's awakening our spirits. You know, he's, he's given us saving grace. Jesus is grace. Shania, what is grace? Shania's name is Grace, right? Have you studied your name, my girl? Jesus is grace. It's the, such a beautiful thing. Um, I was just looking at um, Ephesians 2. I'm going to read out of the word. Where's Ephesians? I've got it marked and I can't even find it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved. Through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. By grace you've been saved. You're not here by accident. God's brought you here for this, such a time as this. For such a time as this, you need to hear these words. You need to hear, you needed to hear Pastor Brett this morning. You needed to hear Pastor Tay this morning. You needed to hear these words today. God has brought you here because of his saving grace. I need to do a study on grace now. Romans 6.14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but you are under grace. God wants me, God wants you to look at him. God wants me and God wants you to only have a heart for him. This is serious. God wants me and God wants you to set your mind on him in every single thing that you do. When you wake up in the morning, thank you, Lord. When you go to sleep at night, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a vision. Thank you, Lord, for stepping me through every single day, every single minute. Now's the time. He wants to set a fire in our soul that we can't contain and that we can't control. It's burning. It's, no, it's now. He wants to pour out his anointing oil and he wants to bring new wine. He wants us to open up and say, here I am, Lord. You do whatever you want to do. Now's the time. <laughs>